Hi, welcome to today's uh, video session. We're going to talk about the proliferation platform in Flojo. My name is Jack Panopoulos. I'm an application scientist for Flojo, a wholly owned subsidiary of BD. And today, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about the proliferation platform, which can be found underneath the tools tab uh, within the biology band. So if you select a sample here, you will see your series of platforms located in this band and proliferation modeling is what we're going to be using today. Proliferation modeling is used for any experiment where you're trying to track the number of divisions uh, that a cell goes through uh, if you're adding some sort of stimulus to those cells and you want to see you know whether or not the uh, the cells actually respond to that stimulus by dividing. Uh, so in our case we have a workspace where we're looking at some cells here and uh, generally speaking, you want to gate down, right? Get rid of all the dead cells, get rid of any doublets, um, and, and kind of get down to the type of cells that you want to look at. And then once you're at your target population, go ahead and invoke the proliferation model. Now, normally what I do here is I'd like to start with a sample that happens to be a control. So there's two types of controls that you want to have for this experiment. The first one is a fully stained sample that has not been stimulated. And then, of course, you should have another type of control, which kind of shows you what the background autofluorescence essentially would be uh, for the cells, and that would be an unstained sample. So in this case, we have the fully stained sample that has not been stimulated. So the graphic that pops up here shows you on the x-axis you're going to see hopefully the channel that um, has the intercalating dye or the dye that you're using to monitor the divisions. In our case, this is the CFSC dye. It's kind of a greenish colored dye. Uh, go ahead and find the sample that is uh, not been stimulated but is fully stained. As I mentioned, I did this already. Uh, that's the first sample in my group. So once you have found that sample, if you want, you can copy the proliferation node to the rest of the samples by using the right-click menu where it says Copy Analysis Group. You can also drag and drop the proliferation node onto the group of choice, onto the uh, target population as well, and then that way all other samples will get the proliferation node. Then you can kind of rotate through your samples here, just, you know, looking for the ones that uh, that have that non -stim or the non-stimulated but fully stained sample. In this case, you can see we really don't have any other divisions. This is where our, our undivided peak is. So I'd like to start with this sample. Go ahead and click and drag across the peak there. The minute you let go of your mouse, it'll give you this little drop down that says fix peak zero. Okay, I like to shift this a little bit towards the right kind of, you know, make sure that if we have any other samples that might be slightly brighter, you know, just shift it a little bit to the right that we encompass those um, so that this is in the right spot. You can use the tool here in the upper left if you would like to, to draw that gate. Otherwise, just click and drag in the uh, platform itself. Once you have set the undivided peak, find that particular sample. You can do so by looking at the blue diamond here, and then I would again copy this to the rest of the group because you want to use that undivided peak it needs to be the same across all the samples that you want to compare. So once that's set up we can kind of rotate through the rest of our samples here and the next sample I want to deal with really is I'm looking for a sample that has the most number of divisions and that are easy to see. So this sample is pretty good. I can count the divisions here. This looks like I have got one peak, two peaks, three peaks, four, five, six, and probably a seventh over here. So once you find the sample that has the most number of divisions and that are easy to see, you can go ahead and click the proliferation expansion menu here and feed it, feed the model the number of peaks that you see. So we always count the number of peaks and then we add one. In my case, I counted seven. So I'm going to add one to it and I'm going to make it eight. Okay, the minute we adjust that value, you will notice here in the right hand pane, there's going to be a series of generational statistics. So you have your undivided peak. It tells you how many cells are in that particular region and then generation one, two, three, four, so on and so forth for each one of these peaks. If you want to visualize 
those peak numbers down here where it says graph. Tick the box that says show peak numbers. A little bit hard to see, but there's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. all the way on through. You can also draw the model sum if you would like while you're here, so you can kind of see what Flojo is modeling. The red line in this case is the model. The black line represents the boundary with the raw data, right? So the, the actual data is the black line. Now, in general, the proliferation model does a pretty good job to try and, you know, figure out how many cells you have here uh, per generation. And it tries to adjust the uh, width of all of the uh, peaks here so that they are reasonable. Uh, but you still have control over this and you can actually modify it. And uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to try and modify this, uh, this model so that we can reduce what's called the root mean squared value. The root mean squared is just a measure of the distance between the model and uh, the raw data. So the lower this number is, the better the model fits the actual data. And it's kind of a combination of what you see by I and uh, the values that you see in the root mean squared. There are some other statistics here as well, all of the indices related to uh, the division of cells at the sort of top right. And then the statistics that are associated with the model itself. We have eight peaks. We have a, uh, a peak CV value of, of about 1.3. So this is essentially the width of each one of the peaks here. We're assuming that they're all going to have the same width. So they're all set to one point, approximately 1.4. The peak ratio is essentially the distance between the peaks here. So peak 1 versus peak 2, it's about, peak 2 is about half the distance away from peak 1. And then the background uh, currently is set to zero, meaning that there is no background stain. So ideally we would have an unstained sample here that we could then tell the model where that background um, uh, sort of is, where, where the background value ought to be. Okay, so to work on this model, to constrain it further if we would like, generally speaking, I might start with the fixed CV. If the, uh, the width of these histograms doesn't look quite right, we can go ahead and tick this box and then we can make them fatter or smaller and just monitor whether or not we're getting a higher or lower RMS value at the top. Okay, so currently the peak is set to 1.3. What happens if we double this, for example, and go to, go to about 3? You can see that we quickly make these histogram, uh, each peak histogram width uh, quite a bit wider. And uh, although we do improve the RMS value here, you can actually see that the model looks really pretty terrible, right? Our model sum, for example, just really seems to understand this as being one big peak, and so what, we're just dividing that one big peak into multiple uh, components. So maybe an improve, improvement in RMS, but not an improvement in what we see by eye, and certainly I would say that these peaks do not match the raw data very well. So if we walk it down, let's see what happens. Do we improve the model or make it worse? Most likely we're gonna make it worse because at 1.3, we're around 40. At three, we went up to 90. Here we're at a value of 2, and we can see that we've got a value of around 50. Now this matches a little bit better, uh, but I would say it's probably still, those peaks are still a little bit too fat. Come in here, go ahead and change that maybe to 1.5, looking a little bit more reasonable. Okay, If your peaks are shifted towards the right or towards the left, you can use the fixed ratio box here to change the values. So if you need the stuff to move towards the left, lower the value to about, I don't know, somewhere between 0.4 and 0.5. Right. If we move this to 0.45, you can see how that pushes those peaks quite strongly towards the left. And again, we're now asynchronous with the model and our RMS has gone up. This is a fairly sensitive statistic, so walking it up by hundredths is usually going to improve the model. Um, or at least uh, it's going to visually improve the model quite significantly. So 0.47, you can see we're getting more synchronized. If we go up here to 0.5, uh, still probably need a little bit more of a model shift toward the right. Technically, we shouldn't have a value here greater than 0.5, simply because that means that you're actually getting more than 50% of the dye to each daughter cell every time it divides. So to sort of artificially 
push these peaks towards the right. If you're already at 0.5, you can tick the fixed background here, and then you can walk this up. Now, normally I'll say, I don't know, the background is probably around 500, maybe 1,000, something like that. So we can enter that value in and see what happens. We still have a model here that tries to model the peaks, but as you can see, we're shifting those peaks a little bit more to the right, which fits the model, in my opinion, a little bit better. So maybe a background of 500 is, is pretty good. So if we march this on up to, say, 700, what happens to our RMS? And it goes down a little bit, but not a lot, right? If we're at 80 and we give it a background increase of 200, it's kind of a marginal improvement in the, uh, in the model. So we're probably right around the sweet spot of fixing the model and getting the visualization um, kind of, you know, both hand in hand going well together. Once you adjust the model uh, to this sample, you want to take that model and then compare it or at least apply it to the rest of the sample. So again, we go back to the workspace, find that blue diamond, and then copy the analysis to the group. Okay. Once your model is constrained, there are a couple of other boxes here. Uh, the Create Gates box, if you tick this, will actually create a, uh, a hard gate, if you will, for each one of the populations you have. Zero to seven in our case here. The zero represents the undivided. The seven represents the eighth generation that we have over here. Now, these gates are not going to have the same statistics as the generational gates that you have here, okay? Because the model, these statistics are derived mathematically. This is a prob probabilistic model, uh, so they don't operate by high gates, right? It's a, it's a mathematical model. The gates that are created here actually have hard bins or hard boundaries, and so the numbers here are not going to match what you see uh, in the platform. These gates, I would use solely for visualization purposes. If you want to just compare, let's say, the you know peak three of sample number one to peak three of sample number two and get a general idea of whether or not you have more cells in that division, um, you can go ahead and do that. And I'll just show you how to do that here real quick. Right? Let's say we're going to pick this sample. Uh, we can already see that the sample, the third generation, isn't that great. But let's go ahead and take this sample, which is uh, the blue diamond here, we want to say, okay, for this particular sample, we want to create those gates, and we want to compare Division 3 of that sample to Division 3 of the other. We can open up the Layout Editor here, and then we can take these gates, and we can say, well, how do these two compare to one another, right? Overlay them, and in the overlay, because it gives us counts along the y-axis, we can see whether or not there is fewer or more in one versus the other. So in my case, the red sample here has more cells in it in that third division and than the blue sample. And the, that is what we see here in the model, at least that's what we perceive. Okay. Once you have the model copied over to everything, you can also use the layout editor to visualize all this information. So you can drag over your proliferation model and uh, it will contain all the generational statistics here in the panel. If you want to modify this, you can always come in and delete any one of these uh, statistics and the ones that are highlighted in green you can actually add mathematical functions to if you want to multiply, divide, etc. and come out with some different number you can certainly do that as well. The other thing you can do with the proliferation uh, platform is you can take all of this information to the table editor and export all of these statistics. So drag in the proliferation node into the table editor here and it will carry over every statistic that you see in this panel. So essentially everything on the right here gets transferred into the table editor. Again, if there's stuff that you're not particularly interested in looking at, like the model uh, standard deviation, perhaps the, um, you know, the, the peak CV is not interesting. You don't need the peak ratio or the background. These are all things that are associated with adjusting the model. You can go ahead and delete uh, those statistics. Everything else might be of interest to you, in which case you can go ahead and heat map it if you'd like. Cog it, create the batch report. This will give you a table here that heat maps your statistics so that you can kind of take a look at what's going on 
uh, in your experiment, whether the cells are dividing or not, etc. And of course, you can export this as a CSV or an Excel file if you would like. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Thank you.